Fresh off a Daytona 500 win, we have TTT athlete Jeff Cordero. Jeff is a member of a NASCAR pit crew and a professional bow hunter, both of which are some of the most pressure-packed jobs in the world. In this episode, Jeff will give tips on how to perform under pressure as many of you head into quarterfinals. Oh, you're playing, you're gonna actually do your face now. Oh. Are you changing it up? Changing it up, that's why I hung the thing. Okay, I was wondering. All right, we don't usually have someone outside of the CrossFit space, but we do have someone special today. Jeff Cordero is coming on. You guys, your team, Hendrick Motorsports with William Byron, just won the Daytona 500. So congratulations. Yeah, let's get a little clap That's a big deal. Thank you. And it's super cool. Tell them why, man. (laughs) You tell me why it's super cool. Well, I mean, in, in this sport, the Daytona 500 is kind of looked at as like they, you know, the Super Bowl of it. And maybe you could tell me why do they front load the Okay. The, the Super Bowl, like everyone says the Daytona 500 is the Super Bowl of NASCAR, right? Theatrics. I that. I don't agree with it. Yeah. Cuz why do they keep saying the, it? At the Super Bowl you crown a champion. Bingo. So for us at the end of the season, that is our race. That's our Super Bowl. But when it comes to like the fanfare, the the marketing of it, like the publicity of it. I mean, we had Dwayne the Rock Johnson doing gentlemen start your engines. Yeah, like, he's not coming. That's pretty cool. That. Though. Yeah, it's so cool. So, from that standpoint of it, it is the Super Bowl. It's the thing that like they probably put more effort into. You know, building up throughout the off season to like promote it. So that's why I think people call it the Super Bowl yeah, because yeah. of all like the theatrics and I was all playing, the production yeah. that but goes with it. I mean, it's it, you are gonna love this because I'm gonna bring golf into this, but it's kind of like the major championships in golf, right? Because you still have, about yeah, that. yeah, you still have the winner at the end of the year, but like the masters, like if you win the masters, that's the thing. And that's what the Daytona 500 is. That's exactly what it is. Or like, uh, in tennis, this is the same way you have like your Wimbledon or something like that. That's their, that's the thing that they want to win. Yeah. Like when you're a golfer, like it's just another week on the, on the schedule. But when you win the masters, it's, you're the masters champion. It's, right. It's an event that is just elevated compared to all the other events. You and know? it sticks so with you forever. Like You'll forever you'll be, be a Daytona 500 winner. Uh, I can't I'll remember. Be a Daytona 500 champion. Champion. It's the only race uh, in our sport okay. for the whole season where when you win that race, you are the champion. So it's it's like if you go and get introduced to anywhere, like driver intros, whatever, it's William Byron, the 2024 Daytona 500 champion. Learning something new. Yeah, did, yeah. We, did we say in your intro that he's not the driver in that? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, we just, everyone's just like, press down. play, oh, and I just oh, started boom. rambling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do you do on the team? So my responsibility on the team is I'm the front tire changer. Yeah. And how does that work? Like when you, we everybody that's listening to this is a CrossFitter, right? So they're yeah. like, I do it by myself. Now you have a team in place. So you have your driver, but then you have a pit crew, right? Yeah. And how many people are on that pit crew and kind of what are the roles? Okay, so there's five of us that go over the wall and that actually service the car when we come in for pit stops. We have myself, the front tire changer. We have a rear tire changer. We have a jack man and a tire carrier. And then we have a gas man. And But all five of us, we work in like this awesome synchronization it be, yeah. it is a team if you watch effort. our video that jeff was in there called is rogues yes. rex yes. and racing it came out like six months ago there's a piece where it's all about me and kyle ruth going to uh the atlanta race last year and y'all won and so go watch that and there's lots of footage of you doing every time i've work. been scheduled to come here we've won the week before you've been doing a lot of winning and as so, a matter of fact i will first- see you November 12th, because that's the week after. That's like two days <laughs> Yo, after the championship. Hey, but hey, <laughs> the first year schedule. I got into NASCAR, 2019, when I finally was like, I'm going to watch a full season, uh, was the year you won the championship with Kyle Busch. So yeah. we're just good I luck mean, for you. Hey, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll make this a weekly thing. I'll come down to <laughs> keep every winning. week and do it. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah. Last year, you guys won six times, right? Yeah. Am, am I right in that? And then, obviously, you started the season in Daytona this Winning. year. That's how this and, – and you win. So, what are, like, as far as looking at the season forward, what are the goals for your team? Win as yeah. much as possible. Um, I think William has a goal. He wants to win 10 races in a year, which not many drivers have ever accomplished. I was going to ask, has that ever happened? It's happened. Okay. Um, but it's very rare. It's just so hard. It's gotten win. harder. It, way harder. Winning on na- winning on the NASCAR circuit is like winning in golf. Like if you win 5 8% of the time, you're a Hall of Famer. Right. You lose a lot of races. So the fact that you can go out there and win six races of a 36-week schedule, like that's huge. That is just that's dominant. We won the most races in this series last year. So it just to have those goals, it's it's from a young kid like that. He's 26. It's awesome that he wants to do this. He puts in the work. And I, I do think our team, we're 100% capable of doing that. I'm going to ask you how you got into it, but I'm actually interested. How do, how do drivers get into the sport? And then how do they kind of elevate themselves into Well, if you want to watch the Netflix show I told you to watch, which <laughs> hey, everyone hey, should go. Everyone else Travis Mayer watched it. He loved yeah. it. Yeah. 
Yeah, so most drivers come up, you know, they start racing as a young kid, and then they start coming up through the ranks, go-karts, you know, a little short track stuff. Then you go to maybe some regional stuff where you're still driving some, like, local short track cars, and then you kind of progress up, and if, if the situation's right, you end up in the truck series or the ARCA series, the truck series, Xfinity, and then you end up in the cup series. And that could be, like, you could start driving when they're seven, eight years old, right? And then they might not make it to the Cup Series till they're 18, 20, if they possess the talent and they have the right opportunities. So you start at your jam, then you go to the local comp, right. and you go That's to Wadapalooza. Exactly right. Same yeah. thing. Yeah, you have to work your way up through the ranks to kind of get there. Yeah. Um, and then, but William kind of had, he had a different upbringing. Like, he's, you know, young, so he started in, like, the video game world. So we have a, like... There's a lot of video games out there that simulate racing, but right. there's actually one that is really good. It's called iRacing, and it's on it's on a computer. You have a steering wheel, gas pedal, everything. All the tracks that are on that game are actually tracks on the circuit, like all throughout the country, right? They go there, and they scan these tracks. So it's very realistic. Like when you go to the track, it's all the same stuff. It's all the same banners on the wall. It's the same groove. It's yeah. Everything looks the same. So that's what he started doing, you know, as a young kid. No was way. Racing on that, video games. And then, you know, he caught the attention of the right people. He got in a Legends car, started running the Legends car, was super successful, and then worked his way up the ranks, got teamed up with Mr. Hendrick way early on in his career, and he's just been that is like a prodigy That is absolutely insane. That's going to be the new thing, though, right? 100%. Like as, as we get deeper and deeper into technology. He's the first person to do it, and then since that, there's been a, a slew of other drivers <laughs> that have come into our sport. That That's how they got their start. They didn't start at the local short track, you know. Not that there's anything wrong with either way, but... He just, that's how he got to start. He just started racing, caught the attention of the right people and got the opportunity. And then when he got the opportunity, he excelled at it. So it was kind of like, this just works. I remember my first job was GameStop. And I remember there was a period where the army tried to do that. <laughs> the army made their own video <laughs> game. Well, yeah. it wasn't Call of Duty. They made their own video game. and For what? To select? <laughs> that's, oh, that's it, was, it. it was like, you know, we'll get you Strategy. started here and then <laughs> yeah. you work your way up. So I was, I'm going to go back to pit crew in a second, but I was yeah. watching this video the other day. It was an F1 driver, <clears throat> but it was with Tyreek hill who's a receiver for the miami dolphins I, have you seen this video where they're doing the it's like a hand-eye coordination where he'd have his hand on the oh, guy's and shoulders dropping the and they're dropping the ball yeah. and he has to reach underneath it and the the speed of the driver was insane would you say the same speed the reaction time the hand-eye coordination of a nascar driver is similar to like an f1 driver probably um i think those f1 cars are a little more fidgety a little twitchier right um they just go way faster than what we go yeah um but still you have to have those like you watch the end of the Daytona 500, yeah. you have to have the reaction to uh -huh. be able to do the right thing and avoid those wrecks. And, you know, that's there's a lot going on. Yeah. So what I happened after? Yeah, tell us the part. Uh, so what happened after is usually when you win the Daytona 500, it is a burn the town down party. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, we ran the Daytona 500 on a Monday because it rained all weekend. Well, on Saturday before the Daytona 500, there's an Xfinity race, which is the B-tier series of NASCAR. That race got rained out. We were supposed to run that before the Daytona 500 on Monday. Well, we get to the track at 9 o'clock. It's still raining. So they postpone it until 9 p.m. after the Daytona 500. Oh, no kidding. Well, we pit those Xfinity cars as well, you know, as like a secondary gig on Saturday. So when the cost, like when that race is over, we go to victory lane and we're like high-fiving, you know, like spraying champagne and like, this is awesome. We got to go pit this Xfinity <laughs> race now. Oh, man. Back to work, right? So there's what no party. Teams. Like we no got kidding. We got to the Xfinity pit box. Uh, like, that team we have, the JRM team, number 18, they did an awesome job. Like, they knew. Who's we driving that for car. them now? Sammy Smith. Okay. We They knew we were what we do. They know what car we pit. Like, our crew chief used to be an engineer at Hendrick Motorsports, so he gets it, right? Nobody's going to ask us to skip victory lane for the Daytona 500. Right. And if they did, no one was going to listen to him anyways. We got to the Xfinity pit box like two laps into the race. Like they had already started. Wow. We hadn't showed up yet. I showed up in, <laughs> to the pit box with a bottle of champagne in my hand and a sleeve of Victory Lane hats. <laughs> and Dale Jr., who's the team owner for that, you know, legendary guy in NASCAR, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Yeah, who's that? And yeah, who is it? Right. And he was just like, we show up. He's the first guy. Hey, man, congratulations. That's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, we're still That's in a like, good impression. <laughs> we're still in like our like our cup fire suits. Right. It's not the same sponsor. It's not yeah. even the same organization. You're soaked in champagne. Soaked in champagne. <laughs> it's getting cold out. And we're like, is this okay if we wear this? He goes, yeah, I don't yeah, care. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. he's just like, he's stoked because he's like tweeting out in the middle of the race. He goes, I got Daytona 500 champions pit in my car tonight. That's nice. awesome. You know, so it's like, it's really cool to get like, Dale's won it before. He won it 10 years prior. Um, he understands that. Nobody was like, where were you guys? Like, they know. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's really cool to, like, 
have the grace to be able to go and enjoy the victory lane, not have to cut it short. But usually afterwards, there's a big party. NASCAR keeps you. There's like a whole induction ceremony into like the like the Hall of Fame there in Daytona where they, they take your car, your victory lane car, and they put it in the museum for a year. You don't get it back. It's really? theirs for a year. That's awesome. So it's like there's a whole ceremony. You go sign the car. You do all this stuff. Well, none of that happened because usually it happens on Monday. We got rained out, et cetera. So – we didn't get a chance to party and burn Daytona down like most Daytona 500 champions do. So we got together as an organization on Wednesday, had like a little happy hour because our team, like the 20 guys on our team, yeah, we won the race, but it's we're not the ones that like won the race. It is an organizational win to, to win at a place like that. It takes everybody. Right. So we had a little like happy hour. Everyone gets together and takes pictures with the trophy and does all that. And then last night we had our little team get together where we – Burn the city of Charlotte down. So when's the next race? How often are you guys racing now? This weekend. Yeah. So it's yeah, I'm every, going to race every track tomorrow. Every weekend from here until. Yeah, we run from the end of uh, time. Yep, yeah, pretty much. It's <laughs> Valentine's Day weekend, roughly. So February right. 18th this year until November 10th. It's a full. We have two. The only two months. off weekends we get in that entire stretch is the Olympics, and that's because TV broadcasting, the same company that does us for that time, does well, that's the Olympics this year, though. That's special, yeah, every right. four right. years. I want to talk about the season because I think we actually can kind of relate this to like maybe a CrossFitter thinking about when they're doing things and how they're training. But I want to go back to pit crew yeah. because we talked about the driver and Daytona. But how did you get into the sport? Like we ask that to CrossFitters all the time. And it's like, oh, I just walked into a gym. But like this is a little bit different than maybe walking into a gym, right? Yeah, I think – the average person you see on like on the street doesn't really know much about NASCAR or racing in general. Um, my dad was a huge racing fan. My grandmother was a huge racing fan. Like they grew up going to the racetracks, you know. So when I was little, as long as I can remember, my dad, my grandmother, we went to the racetracks every Saturday night. Who was y'all's favorite driver? It was like local stuff. Like oh yeah, strictly like, local. You no, know, like yeah, New England, Connecticut, Dennis Gata, Waterford Speed Bowl. Like that was my guy because yeah. he was from the same town I was. That's so I was cool. like, he's my guy. And he was winning all the time at then. So it was like it was awesome. Um, go to the Waterford Speed Bowl, a little short track. It's just your blue collar workers hustling all week long to put together a race car to go out there and bang doors for thirty five laps. It's yeah. if you've never been to a race before, like going to a NASCAR race is something awesome and it's really cool, but going to like a short track program, that is the roots of our sport. That's where everyone starts, whether it's pit crew guys, mechanics, drivers, okay. for the most part. I'm not going to learn how to change tires on a video game. So. Right. And is it for the love of the game at that level? Oh, yeah. yeah. They're making no money. Like, you might win a race, you might pay 125 bucks, maybe 200 bucks. And you're you putting know, way more work your, in than your that. Your tire bill for that weekend might be 200 bucks. let alone if you wrinkle any fenders or the gas to get there. You know, right. Everyone who's working on those cars is volunteer. It's just it's a fun thing to do. It's like your local stuff. It's yeah. your local comp, you know. So... I, as long as I can remember, I was going to the racetrack. I get to high school, and a kid I'm in school with, I'm friends with, he's got a race car. So it's like, hey, can I come hang out? Yeah, go ahead. Come on. So we get to that. I get to start hanging out with him. I know nothing about I, – I can change oil on a car. I can rotate tires. But I don't know anything about race cars. I start going and just – one thing after another, just start laying bricks together and just starting learning a little task. They'd give me some more responsibilities. I'd mess something up. I'd get another responsibility and just start to work at it. I did that until I got into college. And then I really realized pretty quick college is <laughs> not my thing. <laughs> I was spending a little bit too much time doing the extracurriculars and skipping school and not paying attention in class because I was going to working on race cars. I was going out and partying. Were you studying? Was, Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> on paper, what did it say you were trying to study? Liberal arts. Uh, like <laughs> yeah, nothing. Like, generic. You didn't like, pick anything, okay? Yeah. Well, that was the other part of it, too, is I, I didn't go to college with, like, a, I want to be a, you know, a design engineer. I right. want to be, a, you know, a whatever. I didn't have anything. I, I went to college because that's what you do after high school. Yeah. My parents didn't go to college or they weren't, like, right out of high school go to college. So, like, for me to get accepted and to go to college was a huge deal. So, like, that's why I went because I was like, this is what you do. This is how you get a career. You yeah, know? yeah. Long story short, it's not quite how everyone That's has it, to do yeah. it. But Well, it's funny because most people, even if they do go to college, they don't get a career in the thing that they studied, right? It's like, it's, it's crazy. Nerd. Yeah. So I just started doing that, and I kind of got to a point in my life where I needed to make a decision. I either quit school and go racing, or I quit racing and pay attention in school. Well, I'm 21 years old. What, what am I going to do? School out the door. See you later. Packed everything I had in a 10-passenger van. My parents moved me to North Carolina. I knew three people at the time when I moved here, and I just hustled. This is the thing I was going to do. There was no plan B. There was no... Was it with your the buddy from high school? or was No. Nope. Okay. He's still racing back at home. Where's um, the connection then to go to North Carolina? That's If you want to do this full-time, if you want to 
work in NASCAR. Okay. You have to be in North like Carolina. Like the Hollywood. Yeah. Everyone's there. Yeah. So it's like when everyone was moving to Cookville to compete in CrossFit right, right. kind of thing. So it's that's where everyone's at. That's where you have to be. You're not going to get a job. I'm not going to get a job offer in Connecticut to move to North Carolina. Cause right. What, I have no, like, I s- possess no skills for anyone to so hire So were you me. scared of shit when you did that? Not really. You were like, it's one of ho. It's one of those things, like, I've been very, I don't know, I don't know if I have the right mindset. I don't want to suggest everyone have it. But, like, when I d- decide I'm going to do something, it gets done. Yeah. Like, I'm it. just going to do it. Like, I'm going to work in NASCAR. There was no, like, well, what if I do if it doesn't work? Like, I'm going to give myself six months. No, I'm just going to do it. It doesn't matter what the job is, whether I'm a mechanic, whether I'm changing tires, whether I'm wrapping cars. Like, I just decided I was going to work in NASCAR. Can I pause you real quick? At that point, did you have, like, a um, a preferred job area you were hoping to get? At pit that race point? cars. Yeah. To pit them. So, yep. from the start, you wanted to pit. It just looked cool. Yeah. Like, it just looked I mean, awesome. It, it does look awesome. I, I, I realized really early in my life I was not going to be a driver. I didn't have the money to get, like, a little short track car, and I didn't know anything about racing. So, like, me driving, like, I can go to the go-karts, and I can throw down with anyone, but I wasn't going to be that. That was not going to be me. I would already missed the boat to be, like, a to move my way up the ranks. I didn't have – we didn't have money to, like, invest into that. And, yeah, but working in racing is about as close as I'm going to get. Like, that's that was the ultimate goal. It so didn't really matter. Where did you start then? You moved to North Carolina. Yeah. And like, what are you doing first? So there's actually a pit school in – North Carolina, where they teach you how to do all the positions on the pit crew. It's the Performance Institute and Training. It's, we call it the pit school. Mm-hmm. Um, and essentially, it's an eight-week crash course. You get there. You learn how to jack race cars, carry tires, change tires, gas race cars. And then after that eight-week course, like I said, it is like the, the fundamentals class when right. you come to a CrossFit gym. Then you can get a membership there. I don't know. It's like 50 100 bucks a month. I don't know what it is now. But – then you essentially have the facility to practice as much as you want. There's a little gym inside. You can work out, and you just kind of – you go to town. You try to learn the craft. Um, How many people are doing this with you at the same time? I think there was 12 in my, like, onboarding class. Yeah, but, like, in the whole program, there was probably 40 of us, 50 of us. Because guy, what ends up happening is people get into it, and they try it for a little bit, and then they go, ah, it's not for me. It's not for me. Because yeah. they have to, like, the hustle. The hustle game, when you first start, like, you got to hustle. And, like, that just wasn't for them. They, Do you they, mean doing the actual job or or doing all the things necessary to get the job? Everything. Yeah. Like, the 10,000 hours, like, how to get good at a craft, like, you have to do it. Like, and you have to immerse yourself. And it has to be the thing that you do um, to get good at it. Because we're talking, when we're talking being the difference between good and mediocre in our sport is two-tenths of a second. Yeah. Which is nothing. You ask someone how long a second is, they're like, oh, it's really quick. A second for me is an eternity. Right. So, like, yeah, you mess up for a second, you're screwed. You're done. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's one of those things where, like, you have to be really good at your craft. Um, so, the hustle part of that, but then again, you're trying to get jobs at places where they already have people. You know, you're trying to take someone else's job essentially, and you're trying to come in with no experience. You're trying to get the basic level entry job, like, whatever the thing is. Like, I'll sweep the floor, I'll re glue lug nuts, I'll do whatever I can do just to get an opportunity. Yeah. Did that. I think I hustled for about 10 months before I even got an opportunity. And I, the first gig I actually got was with a team at Roush and I pitted my first four races for free. They, wow. They paid me to like, they paid all the expenses to go to these places. We're going to like, this is from North Carolina. So the drive, we're going to New Jersey. We're going to Toledo, Ohio. We're going to Michigan. They're 10 hour drives in a van with six dudes, <laughs> you know, and guys, you probably don't know, right? Like you're getting to know them on the drive. Yeah, You're getting yeah. to know them. <laughs> and like, they didn't, they were like, we're not going to pay you to do this, but we're going to pay your expenses. You're, $25 a day for per diem, which is nothing when you're trying to eat on the road. You're going to drive to all these races, and you're expected to be to work on Friday and be back by Monday. Wow. So it's like you're like driving through the night at some of these places for free because you love it. Yeah. That is so underappreciated. I feel like all the time I'll, I'll suggest to people who have ideas of things they want to do, uh, what do you think I should do? Do it for free for a little bit. And it's just people don't want to bite down on that. But I think the people who end up getting the places really do entertain the idea of just Doing it for free. I mean, for me, it was a, it was an open door, and I was I was not gonna pass by an open door, even if I, you know, in the elevator's closing, you try to like stick your foot in there, like that last little bit, like you're like I gotta catch this. That was me. Like, yeah, it you're was sticking, like a, well, you're sticking your head in. Well, yeah, 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 much. yeah. I'm like diving through the door. Right. Like I'm like I'm going in. Like Man, I don't care if it's free. It really is such a good lesson just in life because you're gonna have to take some risk and you're gonna have to hustle. To Chris's point, but like if we took this back to CrossFit, like all those that usually listen to our podcast, most people say they want something, but they're not really willing to work for it, right? Like yeah. I want to make the games or I, I want to get better at the skill or I want to get muscle ups or whatever, but it's like 
they're just kind of keep having fun and throwing down, but they're not really actually doing the work for it. And so like, what a good testament to know that you have to push yourself to get into that. I, I, there was a point in time where like I needed to get better at handstand pushups because Kyle was my trainer at the time. Like, yeah. It was a huge deficiency I had. I need to get better at push handstand pushups. I just assumed I'd just get better at them because I wanted to, you know, <laughs> but then once you start putting in the work and you start layering, it's not like you can do a, a six week program. Yeah. You can learn the skill, but you're not going to be proficient at it in six weeks, but like six years, if you stay diligent, like just a little bit, that here, 10, little bit hours there, you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So when you went through the onboarding process, you go through each of these different skills. Where did you, when did you choose? Like, I want to be the left tire changer or did they choose that for you? They don't choose it for you. They kind of give you recommendations based on your size, like you know, okay. six six, you're two hundred pounds, six six six, two twenty five. You're not going to be a tire changer, right? You're probably going to be a jack man. You know, you might be a tire carrier. You're probably going to be a fuel guy. I kind of fall in that range where I was like one hundred ninety pounds at the time, six foot. Where if I put on a little bit of weight, I could have been a jack man. If I kind of stayed where I at, I carried tires, and I was a little big for what they wanted for tire changers fourteen years ago. But the tire changing thing just looked the coolest. And to be 100% honest, like from what I had gathered at that point, like that's who got paid the most. So okay. I was like, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I want to do. Yeah, that's exactly. So what is that what you started with when you started doing these things for free? Were yeah. you already changing tires? I okay. was changing tires. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so you, when you got into it, you started there and like you've just perfected the craft over time. Yeah. It's one of those things that like a good tire, ch like not to take away from any of the other positions, but like good tire changers are probably the backbone of a team. Like, you can build a good team, but if you don't have good tire changers, it just doesn't stand the test of time. Why it is just, that? It's just, I don't know. It's just the thing. Like, you can have an okay Jackman, and you can have really good tire changers, and it you don't really get exposed as a team, but you can have the best position players, Jackman, tire carrier, and if you have two mediocre tire changers, it just doesn't. You can throw down a good stop every now and then, but the consistency, like our sport is all about speed and consistency throughout the year. If you don't have consistent tire changers throughout the year, and that's what makes good tire changers, you just don't have it, you know? I don't know why. It's just how it is. Like it's any a little more involved, I guess. Yeah. Can you walk us through the whole process? So let's just say your car's coming in. Give us a rundown of like what the, how those pieces come together with your team as you go over the wall. All right, I'll do this the best I can. There is a video. Yeah, well, yeah, we yeah. Have this. But I think, I mean, this is cool because, again, like we always think of CrossFit, like you're just doing it yourself. But even in that space, the pieces come together on a weekend. And yeah. obviously it's different, but still you're thinking about, okay, how do I execute this workout, next workout, so on. Because all these points total up. For you guys, every time you're changing or every time someone's filling up the tank, like it has to be perfect. Otherwise you get behind, right? Yeah, so the car comes in. Um, Hold on. Actually, I've gone to multiple races thanks to Jeff at this point. Can you start a little bit before car comes in? Because okay. one of the most interesting things is like just the buildup that comes before that. Is there? Can you explain that first? Yeah. So there's there's points in the race when we know a caution is going to come out with the stages. Like they're they're planned pit stops. We know that's going to happen. And then there's other points when cars wreck. Caution comes out. Right. You might come down. And put tires on. So you're not not that you're not ready for. It. You're always ready for it, but they're not planned. Well, caution comes out, whether it's one of a wreck or a stage break, and it starts immediately. Like, the tires get put on the wall. You know, everyone's starting to strap their stuff together. Everyone's getting ready on top of the wall, and then we have a bunch of support people behind the wall that manage everything behind the wall to make it for us to do our job right. over the wall. So it's, it's, it's a whole team. It's not just the five of us that do a pit stop. It's probably, like, 12 of us, if I'm honest. Those guys behind the wall don't get enough recognition, but – it takes a team effort. So it's like Chris said, it's like this buildup. You're like, you're getting ready for it. And you're like, okay. And then if the car is not handling the way that they want it to handle, you know, the crew chief might want to make an adjustment to it to better suit the driver and make him happy. So then you're now getting these, these calls on the radio, like, Hey, we're going to do this spring adjustment. We're going to do this. And you're trying to gather all that information, put the play together to be able to react, to get all that work done as fast as possible and get them out first. So then caution comes out, cars start coming down pit road. At a place like Atlanta, they're going like 50 miles an hour down pit road. Daytona, they're doing 60. Ugh. Yeah. So it's like depending on the track, you know, you're jumping out. Like if you want to know what it's like, you stand on the no, they line. Do. On the, no. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah, Don't, Don't do, do it. it. <laughs> but it's like they're coming down. Um, you're, that driver's looking for his pit stall. And it's deceiving on TV because you were just watching it go 195. And yeah. Yeah. But it's real when you're out there on a bicycle oh, helmet and knee pads. Yeah. <laughs> So the car comes in, um, the car is going to stop, and we want the driver to stop on the mark every single time because that's one of those predictability things. Like if we know we're going to stop, 
we can already start initiating our first movements before he stops, and all that is free time. Yeah. And it, before the, the stopwatch starts when the car stops. So if you can start your process a little bit before the car stops, maybe two, three uh, tenths, it's free time. Right. So it's like the transitions. It's like making sure you're in the right spot for right. it. So the car comes in. Um, my responsibility, front tire changer, I get on the lug nut. I take the lug nut off. As soon as the car's on the way up, Jackman, in the same time as Jack and the race car up, I pull the tire off. I throw it to the wall. The tire carrier runs out there with two tires. He sets one off at the right front and then runs all the way around to the right rear, which the rear tire carrier is doing the same thing. And the jack man comes off the end of the jack handle after the car's up, picks up the right front tire, puts it on. I tighten the lug nut up, and then we all run around to the other side, and we do the whole process again on the left side. And that whole pit stop is eight and a half, nine seconds long. Yeah, it's it's fun to watch. It's four, like, four tires, 16 gallons worth of gas in nine seconds. That's absolutely insane. So how do you guys practice this? Like if you're with your entire team, what is that practice set up? And then do you practice on your own for your specific job? So we practice Tuesday through Thursday. Um, and it's just like, just like being at the racetrack. Um, we don't have cars coming around us. It's a little bit more laid back. But we're practicing all the same scenarios. Cars coming in. We have guys that drive the pit stop car for us. We're going through the whole process of, you know, perfecting what we do, um, working on things. Like I said, two tenths is the difference between good and mediocre. So you're trying to like find these tiny, I mean, the tiniest little bit of advantage that you can get, whether it's have your knees in a certain like staggered position, you know, giving your tire carrier room so he doesn't have to get it up over your leg to put it on. He can just sweep it on the car. You're trying to figure all this stuff out at practice. And then, then once you figure it out, you're trying to hone it in and hone it in and hone it in. So and we should way, say at this point that sometimes races are won in a pit stop. Like I think yeah. y'all had two of them last year where y'all got out first and that was the end of it. Yeah. So like it can come down to the end of the race. You're taking four tires and it's, Pit road, positions gained and lost on pit road is a sum zero game. Yeah. In order for you to gain them, you have to take them. So, like, you want to be good, but you also want to go out there and beat everybody to do it. And it's those two tents that you've spent six months training and trying to find the smallest little things that nobody else can see, that you can't see on film, but you know you're trying to figure it out to get that advantage over your competition. Yeah. What are those advantages? Like, what are the little things that your team's working on or the things that you're specifically working on to get faster? So I think the thing that makes a great team in NASCAR is a lot of the people up and down pit road possess the skills to do it. It's the team itself. It's the people we work together. Like, Spencer's my jack man. I never worry about him having to put the tire on. Like, I don't wait to watch him put the tire on and then run the lug nut up. Like, as he's putting the tire on, I'm running the lug nut up with him. And it's just closing all those gaps. It's all free time. It's all transitions. It's just like what you guys yeah. preach in the open stuff. It's it's all about transition. There's no wasted movement. Anything you can do to close a gap as tight as possible, that's what you're trying to do. I mean, sometimes you live on the razor edge. Sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't, but you got to do it. Right. So what about for you, if you're practicing specifically just for the skill that you have to have, are you doing that on your own or is there also time for you to practice that or is it always with the team? No, there's most of the practice that we do throughout the year is team based. Yeah. It's all of us working through it. We've all done this for over 10 years. Yeah. So we all kind of know what we need to do and we can kind of make those adjustments on the fly and practice. But if there's something like I want to work on, so not last year, but the year before the first year we went to the one lug nut, um, I changed tires right-handed. So I would trigger the gun. I pull the trigger with my right hand and I did all that because that's what I had done for 10 years up until that point with the five lug nut. Well, we get to the one lug nut, and the game changes. Now, to be fast, you have to be a left-hand trigger guy. So now I'm Why is to, that? It's just so the car comes in. Like I said, you, I take the nut off, and I'm pulling the wheel. Well, if I am triggering, I pull the wheel with my right hand. If I'm triggering the tire off with my right hand, then I have to let go of the trigger, and I have to reach up and grab the wheel, and then I have to pull it and throw it. When I'm left-handed, as soon as that thing goes on the lug nut, I'm pulling the trigger and grabbing the wheel at the same time. So I just took three it's right three, it's free money yeah, it's yeah. three free tents i found just by switching hands well for someone who's done the same thing for 12 years it's like, hard that was hard yeah and i had to work at it like all it's like season. brushing your teeth with your left hand oh, you're yeah. trying <laughs> if you ever I done love, that I love, i'm like i can't oh, do it it's no it's impossible <laughs> to, me, to me it's so awesome that the, there's so much money on the line I know. so much prestige on the line that y'all go find 
just the smallest amount of time, and it's like pulling teeth to get CrossFitters to look Man, at the video. So that's what I wanted to say is, like, we, we did this whole series, I don't know, was it back in January, maybe like a month and a half ago, where we were talking about pacing and execution. And some people loved it, but it's like you buy into that stuff in CrossFit, it is free. The same thing you just said, switching your hand. Like, yeah, you got to practice it. But, like, there's so many free things in CrossFit where you don't have to get any fitter, you don't have to build your capacity at all that you can just do in transitions that people aren't willing to do. That's one thing, like, when I was going to CrossFit Lake Norman, which kind Kyle Ruth owned for yeah. the longest time. It, it was one of those things. Once we were doing like open workouts and stuff, like this was before it was like cool. We were like laying our plates out, like in the order that they were going right. on. So it's like you make a lift, you walk over, you pick the plate up, you put it on. Like they're as close as they can be. You're doing everything you can. You have your bar set up as close to the rower as possible. You're doing all the things that you can do because transition time, there's no work being accomplished in a transition. And if there's no work being accomplished, you're not getting towards your end goal. So, like, for us in pit stops, if we're wasting time, we're not getting the car out right. any faster. So, if, if we can close, like, everything takes a certain amount of time. Like, a wall ball takes X amount of seconds. Like, these reps, they take pretty much the same amount of time across the board for any athlete. But it's all the stuff in between. Yeah. It's all the stuff that we don't grade. It's all the stuff that nobody else sees. It's That's, that's where the money is. That's where the free time is. That's where you can elevate yourself to be, like, mediocre to good. Do you think that you're just like the experience you've had in a sport that does require all those thoughts helped you with CrossFit? It, I don't even think twice about yeah, it. Yeah. Like just, I just, it, like no wasted movements. There's no loss of efficiency. Yeah. I, I'm not the great <laughs> CrossFitter. Like I barely, <laughs> but you're make thinking the, about it though. Yeah. I barely make the top 10, but I'm like top 10, like percent well, yeah. now with 25, I'm actually <laughs> qualified, but it's one of those things where it's like, I'm not going to get like my main goal. My main squeeze is NASCAR. Like, I'm not going to focus all my time to be a competitive CrossFit athlete. That's not even true. You, you, you well, got a main squeeze and then, like, a mistress. Yeah. yeah. I guess we'll we'll, talk about we'll it. get there. But it's it's one of those things where it's, like, the thing that I can do against somebody else, like, when we're competing in the open or you're just throwing down with your buddies, like, yeah, I might not be fitter than them. But if I can be faster or more efficient through the transitions, like, I can gain time. Totally. Or I can just put myself just a little bit ahead of him or I can put the pressure on him because I got to the bar a little faster because I turned – and I took one step to the bar, and I didn't, like, shuffle step yeah. my way over and hit the chalk. Well, especially when it's uh, peers that are similar level, right? Like, so, and this goes all the way up. Like, games-level athletes, since they're all kind of, like, around the same, like, maybe physiological strengths, if they're better at transitions, that person wins. And then maybe it's top 10%. If you're all the same, but someone's better at transitions, they win. And so, it, it trickles down. It doesn't matter what level of athlete people are. I think in CrossFit, people are like, oh, I'm not that good, so I'm not going to think about it. And it's like, no, you still should be thinking about all the little details because it's going to help you in the long term. Yeah, like, you watch a football game and this is like a big thing like because i'm a huge patriots fan but like when tom brady was going they always had like the graph you know like the laser thing of him throwing the ball his release points and all these things like how fast he gets rid of it like yeah everyone can throw a 60 yard pass down the field but like the way he gets the ball out and how that's fast incredible. he does it's like he just does it better and that's what elevated him to win well, seven that, super yeah, bowls i mean that's what made him so good is his reaction time his ability to read a defense and then get the ball out quickly yeah. compared to again all these other quarterbacks that maybe have a stronger arm can run faster more athletic just more oh, don't efficient get, don't get brandon going on let's tom talk brady. about tom when's he hey, coming he owns snowball now right yeah he does that's that's actually pretty wild he's going to go play for michigan so obviously you talked about crossfit you've been doing it for a long time but was that something that you got into because you wanted to stay fit for nascar was it something that you just like this is a hot and now I enjoy it like what how did you get into that side of things so uh in my beginning part of my NASCAR career the first couple of years I was young dumb I wasn't fitness wasn't a thing it was just kind of like this thing I had to do at work to be part of a pit crew like work out I took I put no effort into it um did probably, they mandated you to have a training program yeah or, every yeah. team has a training okay. program has trainers athletic yeah, staff yeah. the whole thing so like you'd go I'd go and do my workouts and like I'm 23 years old I'm going out drinking I'm doing all the stuff you know they like <laughs> yeah, 20 yeah. year olds do and like going working out I'm like half hung over still which is not advisable but I didn't put priority into it because back when I started 14 years ago like the guys who pitted race cars were just guys who worked in the shop right none of them were really in shape none of them were like x d1 football players or played in the league you know none of that yeah, was, now, now none of that was going on almost. yeah so then I ended up losing my job at the place I was at and I kind of had like a little transition period. And I was like, I need to get in better shape. If I can be in better shape, then I'm already going to, I'm going to pass the eye test when I walk right. into an interview. Like if I look like I'm in better shape than the other guy and we have the same skill, like they might hire the guy who's in better shape. So I was like, I need to get in shape. And I did what any, you know, 
someone who doesn't know does. I went bodybuilding.com. <laughs> Let's you know, go. I followed a straight, you know, like. It can make you look good, though. Sure, but yeah. I, it, there's a lot of things. <laughs> I need to go into that, too. <laughs> but the other part of it was um, I need to be in shape. I need to run. I need to run all the time. So, like, I was working on a golf course, uh, and I'd, I'd go get there at 4.30 in the morning. I'd run the front nine, and then I'd work. You know, like, no that way. was my thing. Like, I, I was run- – I hate running. Yeah. But I'm like, I have to run if I want to be in shape. So you're doing like, I mean, that's like three and a half miles running the it's front not, nine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're doing I a lot. think that's where a lot of my ankle <laughs> stiffness comes from. It's <laughs> yep. running the undulating hills right, of a right. golf course. But um, with terrible technique, heel striking like you wouldn't believe. But it's one of those things where it's like I have to run to be in shape. So then, uh, you know, you get to running and you kind of get into a little bit of fitness. And then, you know, oh, Spartan games, those look fun. Or the Spartan races, they look fun. Let's go do that. So you go do that, and then you kind of get, the running part's not bad, but you kind of get exposed with some of the other stuff. And you're like, well, I need to be a little bit stronger if I want to have more fun at these and like maybe be competitive, right? Not even close, but like you just want right. to, you want to beat people when you get to the obstacles. And so I started looking at like, how do I get fitter for Spartan game or for the Spartan races? And then CrossFit kind of popped in. This is like early 2013. Uh, saw it, bodybuilding.com had like five workouts, CrossFit workouts to do. It was like Linda, Helen, like it's like the benchmark workouts. Yeah. I don't know any better. I don't know how to do half these movements. I go to the Globo gym. I don't have a rower. I don't have kettlebells, but they, they got three barbells I can load up, not knowing that I was going to absolutely destroy myself <laughs> doing the three <laughs> bars of death. But once I did it, I kind of got like I had to scale everything. I was hooked and I just kind of was like, this is the thing I need to do. And I think it's so a bodybuilding this, magazine. Yeah. See, that's awesome. That's what I'm saying. And yeah. it, I, I think it was that, but like going to the gym, again, I had to do a lot of running. So I'd be like on the treadmill running before my workout, doing like two miles, at like a snail's pace. And like they had, you know, they have the TVs up. It's got like Sports Center and stuff on it. And I think at the time I was going there, they had like a recap of like maybe the 2012 games. Mm. And I remember watching that and being like, it's pretty they need cool. To do whatever they're doing. Yeah. That's awesome. These guys are jacked and in it was shape. like the, the dudes, the women. Like, yeah. I'm like, these women will kick my ass. So yeah. I was like, I got to do it. So that's how I kind of found CrossFit and a little Google search ended up at a CrossFit gym. I love that you were, you're focused on an, your actual job, but you still fall in love with CrossFit the same way that everyone does. Like, all these games yeah. athletes are like, yeah, I did Helen or Fran or whatever. It's like always these benchmark workouts. I sucked. It hurt really bad, and then I fell in love with the sport. Well, you look at it. You go to the gym. You're there for an hour and a half. Right. You're doing all these sets and all these reps, and then you look at a workout, and it's like 21, 15, 9. <laughs> I'll do this for my warm-up. You know? Like, <laughs> yeah, you, don't exactly. know it. you don't know any better. Yeah. And then you get absolutely demolished, and you're like, what just happened? That's so And then, funny. yeah, it just it kind of one of those things where it's just if something's hard, I kind of fall in love with it. Like, I want to get better at it. There's not a thing, my wife will tell you this, there's not a thing that I do that I, like, dip my toe into. There's nothing. If I'm going to do something, I kind of get into it, and then it's, like, down the rabbit hole. Yeah. I think you have to be that way to be, like, excellent in anything, though. Yeah. Like, which clearly you've been able to do with your job. So now, this uh, 14 years later, 10 years later, whenever that, that, that phase was, what are you doing for training to focus on bettering your career in NASCAR? So I think when I first started, I was, like, full bore CrossFit. I did, you know, I was lungs bleeding every day, doing the whole thing. And when I was in my 20s, like, I could kind of buffer that a little bit. The older I've gotten and the, the more emphasis I'm putting on, you know, pit stops and being really good at my craft, um, over the course of a 40-week season, CrossFit is not probably the best thing to do because, like, I'm running around, I'm jumping on my knees, and that's a ton of extra reps that, like, you're not going right. to feel because you're in the gym. You're not doing those kind of reps, and those reps are impact reps. They're not just working through ranges of motion. So as the season goes on, you know, your body gets tore up a little bit. I've kind of realized, like, instead of just kind of continually grinding myself, like, I start the beginning of the season, try to get in the best shape I can, um, probably do two to three CrossFit-style workouts, EMOMs a week, and then the rest of that is kind of, like, working on deficiencies. I've had knee surgeries, so it's, like, making sure I'm staying healthy, like, in the lower body, making sure I have good range of motion. Still doing a lot of the things, like, snatches, cleans, and, like, kind of, like, expressing power because sure. a lot of what we do is expressing power getting up moving around yeah. really fast I mean, you got to be fast right yeah so it's it's a kind of a blend the season goes on like i am a hundred percent a cherry picker if i see a workout <laughs> that like looks cool like i'm doing it because i enjoy it i'm not right. doing it because i'm trying to make you know be the regional level athlete or i'm not trying to make the games i'm not trying to go to any local comps but i still like throwing down i still like competing i still like doing that with the boys so it's kind of one of those if it looks like fun and it looks like something that's not going to wreck me to the weekend, like, yeah, I'll do it. Like, there's movements I just absolutely don't touch anymore. Like, pistols, don't right. touch them. Heavy squatting, don't touch it. It's just, for me and what I'm doing and what I want to achieve for my athletic career, like, it's just not the thing that's going to get me there. 
So I just kind of they they have a place in time for everybody. Sure. Just for me at 36 years old, it's kind of for those reasons do, I'm out. <laughs> do, do other guys on the crew uh, jump in with you and um, do some of the CrossFit stuff, or is that just a you thing? There, when I first started in NASCAR, I was probably one of the first couple people to do yeah. it, and I got lambasted for it. Oh, like I everyone's like, "You're an idiot," you know, "You're doing the wrong thing," and then like. You just continue and you stick to it and they see you get in shape and you're getting better at your tire changing career or your pit crew career. And whether those things are, you know, correlation causation, like if one of those things leads to the other, they kind of start picking on. They're yeah. like, hey, can I, can I get in on this workout? Can you, can you teach me how to do some of this stuff? And over the years, there's more of us that do it. Like there's a team, uh, Trackhouse Racing. They actually go work out at a CrossFit gym. Really? So they have two options. You which can is owned by Pitbull. One of the which owners. is owned by Pitbull. Yeah. Mr. Worldwide, Mr. 305, <laughs> which is awesome for our sport. It really is cool. He like, uh, so at that CrossFit gym, they have like a, they have like the CrossFit kind of class. And then they also have like their typical, you know, your gym, your sure. athletics kind of stuff. So the guys can go in and decide, I want to do this or that. And then the programming for that, for the CrossFit side of it, they understand what we do as pit athletes. So they're not going to do anything to jeopardize right. what we do on pit road in the gym. So they understand like, we're not going to do a ton of complex stuff. It's usually a lot of like lung burning, right. sled drags, pushes, sandbag. You know, it's like odd object stuff. And you're going to get a great workout in, but you're not going to put yourself in a compromised position to get hurt because at the end of the day, it's what you do in the pit box is what's going to end up paying the yeah. bills. You were talking about earlier, 15 years ago, most of the guys that were on pit crews were kind of like, you know, they, they just have been in that world, but they maybe weren't as athletic. Today, is that different? Or is it most Way guys? Different. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's the difference? Is it just everyone's more fit? Everyone's focused on training? Has NASCAR shifted the way that they think about pit crew? So the teams, I think, have that's where the teams had started to shift. When I got into the sport, it had started um, before I got there, but I was kind of like on the maybe the upswing of it where they realized like passing cars on the racetrack is really hard. It's a lot of time in the wind tunnel. It's a lot of time, you know, engineering wise to get a car to go faster. And now with this new style of car where we really buy all the parts and pieces from like NASCAR distributors. Like they're like everybody who's at the race, whether it's a Ford, Chevy, or a Toyota, under the body, all the parts and pieces are almost identical. Really? It's just how you put them together. Yeah. Well, when all the parts and pieces are identical, like the competition is super tight. Yeah. It's so hard to pass. In a 30 lap run, a driver might pass two cars if they're if it's a good run. Well, you come down pit road and everyone comes down nose to tail. And if you can, if your pit crew can gain you two spots by being half second faster than those other two it's pit crews, deal. it's a huge deal. So I think teams start to realize that like over time, like what we do in the pits is not just servicing the car. It's there's a competitive side to it. And if we can get better, stronger, fitter people to do it, it we're, it's going to pay dividends. And I think the hardest thing in athletics is teaching someone how to be athletic where you can take somebody who's athletic and teach them how to jack a race car. Right. It's just learning a new skill. You're not doing the 10 years of them, like, learning how to be athletic and be fast and twitchy and, you know, be powerful because that takes time. But right. teaching someone a skill, like, we could bring you in. You could carry tires in a couple of weeks and be proficient at it. You're not going to be great at it, but you could, yeah. you could be proficient at it. Right. You were talking about um, – the gas tank weighs 92 pounds. I think that's what you told me. Yeah. So like roughly and, and you're holding it like how, how is the, the person holding it? It's like over your shoulder. So you yeah, gotta so be pretty strong. It's all not 92 pounds of that or 90, 95 pounds is up over the gas man's shoulder. He's holding on to this little handle and the neck, the fill tube. And all that weight is like above his head. Yeah. So go take a 90 pound dumbbell, everyone that's <laughs> listening and put it like on your shoulder, but it can't, it can't be resting there. Right. I want yeah, someone to can't be really... resting there and it's got to be like three feet tall. You know, <laughs> yeah, so it's exactly. Like, yeah. Take a 95 pound barbell and try to hold it up straight so up and down. I, I say that though, to your point, like it would help if someone's bigger and stronger for some, a position like that. Right. Absolutely. And yeah. you guys have some like six foot six guy that's doing that. We got an absolute freak Landon. He, uh, yeah, he was offensive lineman at Clemson. And it's an absolute stud of an athlete. He actually, you know, made it to the league, didn't play because he had some things that happened. But um, he, you know, he's athletically gifted, went to the league and didn't work out, ended up in NASCAR. Right. And that's like a perfect spot for him. He's 6'6", 270, absolutely shredded. I think people, they, they think of it as like, oh, yeah, they just got into it, whatever. But like, that's a perfect example of at the highest level of any sport, you need to have the best people that fit that demographic well and having a big guy that's strong enough or having someone like you that's fast enough to get over the wall and get to the tire. Like those things matter. And, and again, to your point, like that's how you win races. Yeah. Like Hendrick Motorsports, we do it. All the other teams have some version of it, but we have a combine where we actually bring in, like they'll take a lot of like, we actually go and recruit at all these like 
D1 schools, D2 schools, you know, we start talking to all these like trainers at all these places. Like, Hey, if you got guys that are like, probably not going to make it, you know, or looking for something to do, this is a really good avenue for them to compete, That's make so good cool. money and get into the sport. And then every year we bring in probably 30, 40 kids and they all go through this combine and it's kind of our like test to see, you know, kind of who can do the things that we're asking them to do. And we'll narrow that down and they'll hire a couple, you know, like we have a kid who played for Georgia on the national championship team. And now that he's trying so to like freaking learn cool. how to change tires. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a perfect fit. I'm sure he's super athletic. He's able oh, yeah. to, yeah. So now it's just learning the skill, which obviously takes time, but the, he has the body. He has the athleticism to mm -hmm. do that. Speaking yep. of recruiting though, I don't know if Jeff's going to toot his own horn, but you're one of the best at this job, right? And even got a pretty good job offer at one point from uh, Mr. Michael Jordan. I mean, it's been floated around. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to talk about I, it. I was, I was a free agent for about uh, four days, and that was one of the teams that was trying to get me to come over there. That's mm -hmm. pretty cool to be able yeah. to say. Yeah. I'd like to play golf with Michael. You know he's a big golfer now. Yeah. Uh, now? He's always been oh, a well, big golfer. Oh, that's true. <laughs> he owns a golf course. My girlfriend's dad has golf with him. Has he really? Mm -hmm. That's oh like, man, we gotta talk they got about this off camera. Where he, they got the stogies out. Oh, oh like, god, was, like, was this like a one time? Like he just snuck in, like Mr. Jordan. Can't? No, I'll work like for free for if I can go play eighteen holes <laughs> with Michael Jordan. <laughs> that, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah. So Chris alluded to this, but you also have another uh, a hobby mistress, and I wanted to kind of touch on that because I absolutely love. Hold on, Jeff is married. Maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, have said <laughs> sorry. A hobby, a hobby. That's why I said a secondary that. hobby. Yeah, secondary, secondary hobby. hobby. So with CrossFit, the the. I think the, uh, it's probably not a problem. I shouldn't say that, but I find it as a problem. Most people get into the sport and they become so consumed with CrossFit that they like can't think about anything else in their life. And what happens, they end up overtraining or there's like the, their mindset completely changes to where everything just, I did it. yeah, right. And they're so burdened by that, that they can't create progress. So my suggestion to those people is always, Hey, go find something else that you love and buy into it. You don't have to do it all the time, mm -hmm. but have a hobby outside of CrossFit, outside of the sport that you love, so that you can enjoy the time when you are in the gym. And I think you found that through bow hunting, which most people probably have no clue about. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I picked up bow hunting like when I was working at one of the other teams. Uh, we had a long drive to work every day. It was 70 miles, so it was like really long. Ooh. Yeah, not it, well, it is what it is, right? <laughs> so um, the guys that I carpooled with, because we carpooled, um, they were all kind of hunting. And then, like, as, like, the summer would get along, they'd start getting trail cam pictures of, like, deer that they wanted to go after and that kind of stuff. And I've always thought it was really cool. Like, my dad, when I was younger, he shot a couple deer. And, like, I thought that was the coolest thing, that you can go out there, you know, harvest your own meat. It's it's organic meat. You know where you're getting it from. Um, the whole process that goes into that of, like, cleaning it, getting everything ready, preparing it. It just, for me, it just tastes different. Yeah. And uh, it's, like, more rewarding when you eat it. Like, it means more. Like, I'm not going to leave a little bit on the plate because I know the hard work that went into getting that. Exactly. So they start talking about it. I'm like, I kind of want to get into that. And then hunting, you really have two avenues. You either go bow hunting or rifle hunting or somewhere in the middle. Uh, for me, in North Carolina, I was living in a development at the time. So I started, like, weighing my options. Going gun hunting, I would need to get a gun range membership. I need to buy a gun. Ammo is expensive. And it just turned into one of those, like, there was a lot of more prerequisites I needed. Um, whereas bow hunting, I just go to my local archery shop, get hooked up. I can shoot 20 yards in my backyard, and I can just go out there and fling arrows yeah. when I want, when I have time. What year is this? Uh, 16, maybe? 15? Yeah. yeah. So, nine years ago. Yeah. You jump into this. Start getting into it, and the same thing. Is I this the first time you've ever shot a bow? Yeah, besides, like, summer camp. Okay. Like, a Recurve, yeah, like, so what, yeah. you, did you just, like, talk to your buddies, like, what should I buy and go and get this stuff? Or no, just, like, I did what everyone does. I go to okay. YouTube. Yeah, I yeah, watch a bunch to, okay. of YouTube videos nice. and, like, what to do. And, like, eventually it was just, and this is what I recommend for everybody, is just go to a bow shop. Go to your local bow shop. Talk to those people. It's what they do professionally. It's what they do all the time. They're going to get you in something that is at an adequate price point for what you were looking to spend and kind of get you off the ground. So I went to a bow shop, kind of got the parts and pieces I needed, watched a bunch of like YouTube stuff on how to do things. I slapped the string across my arm, oh, yeah. and bruised the hell out of myself, lost arrows, made a ton of mistakes. But it's just one of those things like in racing, everyone, you're always looking to how can I make my race car a half a percent better? How can I find those two tenths of a seconds for a pit stop? And then getting into archery was the same thing. Like, how can I shoot a little bit better? How can I shoot a little bit further? How can I be more you know, accurate. And you, know, you just start diving into that. And then that's a rabbit hole you jump down. And that started to just kind of consume me. And you just kind of, you just build on it over time. I think we should let the audience know at this point, you've started a YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. Doing, so well, you really have been consumed with it. I think part, so part of that is like athletic 
athletic careers, they only last so long. And then when you're done, you have to find something else to do. You know, some people find out really early in their life that, you know, athletics isn't for them and they have their whole life ahead of them. Well, I'm 36 now. I've been doing this for so long. I have still a lot of good years left in me. By no means am I an uh, aged a out athlete. <laughs> so it's, you know, but eventually I'm going to have to find something to do. And when I get into my 40s, like, you get into the job market and you have no real, I, I have skills that maybe translate to racing, but outside of racing, like what are my skills? You know, where can I fall into the workforce? It's 2024, man. You can go out in there and make your own stuff and make your own right. content and do your own thing and kind of be your own boss. And my wife kind of was the one who suggested it to me. Like I started getting into it and I get a lot of people at the racetrack, you know, know I'm doing the hunting stuff. It's on Instagram. And they're like, you start asking questions and it's like, you start answering a lot of stuff. And she's like, why don't you just start a YouTube channel? I'm sure there's a ton of people out there that want that information. Like you guys give out yeah, yeah. for free. So, so it's wh like, what's the YouTube channel? It's just my name, Jeff okay. Cordero. Yeah. And, w and what kind of stuff are you putting on there right now? It's all archery, um, hunting. Some of it, I've started to get into the target archery side of it, which is just the whole mother side of uh, right. archery. And so it's just, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like, it's my experience in it. It's the avenue that I'm going down. It's if I come across something that's cool and I want to make a video on it, I make a video on it. It's me going hunting. It's, it's a lot of failures at hunting. I don't think enough people post failure videos in anything. I'll post an entire video. One of the of coolest me. videos I've watched on your channel is when you did the solo hunt. And uh, where was that? Where you, where you Montana, had the bear probably. that came in at nighttime? Oh, Colorado. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Wait, you got to tell a story. It, I mean, it's. I went to sleep. You gotta watch the video. Yeah, go subscribe. <laughs> so I like a bear came the, up to the, the notification no, no, bell. No, oh, okay. Not that close. okay, okay. But I went to sleep and it snowed three inches. And then when I got up in the morning and I packed all my stuff up and I'm like, all right, here we go. I'm going hunting. And I started walking. I started looking around at the aspen trees and I saw a lot of claw marks. And I'm like, well, I know, I know I'm in bear country, right. but it's black bears and I've been around black bears and I'm not like overly concerned about it and then i get about 80 yards from my tent and there's like tracks and then all of a sudden it was like oh boy dude yeah, i would be <laughs> terrified oh boy so it's just you know your hair stands up in the back of your neck you just pay a little bit more attention um but yeah i post videos like i'll go on an entire hunting trip and not shoot anything except for content and i'll post it because yep. that's how 90 percent of works. hunting is yeah, yeah. yeah and not enough people i think show that not enough people show the discouragement and the stuff that doesn't go well on a hunting trip walk through just real quick because i'm interested um when you are doing well, let's say you're actually are there competitions for like target shooting now like oh, can yeah. you get in are you oh, get into yeah. that yeah okay he's a he's so, a sponsored athlete over here dude i love it i am all right so let's just say that you're doing that and you're at a certain yardage what goes into shooting a bow versus a gun if it were shooting a target with a gun versus a bow i think the biggest thing um with a rifle um or a gun like you you slowly depress the trigger. The trigger goes off after the click. The bang happens. So there's everything in front of that. The trigger going off or the round going off is pretty static, and you're just aiming and you're focusing on being slow and smooth and controlled. Well, when you go shoot a bow, the bow before you draw it back is at static. Once you draw it back, now it is dynamic. You yeah. are holding this thing apart. You're trying to aim it. You're trying to make sure it stays apart. And there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I think a lot of the same stuff, like if you shoot a gun really well, you can translate that to shoot okay. a, a bow really well or vice versa. Um, it, a lot of it just comes down to like having a process, having a mindset on it, like you're, what you're going to do. And it's all it comes down to is yeah. having a good now, process. Now, does like wind or elevation, the all type of arrow, sense. like all those things play into it? Yeah, it's just how far you want to go down a rabbit hole. Okay. You know, you can go to your local CrossFit gym and just do the group class and just whatever's on the whiteboard that day. That's what I'm doing and not really think twice about it. Sure. Or you can dive in, you know, eight feet deep and right. do like the whole training, like getting a personal trainer, having someone write a specific program for you. It's just how far you want to go with it. Yeah. How hard is it to pull the, the bow back? Like um, the, what's the draw? Is it draw strength? Is that draw what, weight? Draw weight. So like my hunting bow is like 75 pounds. Yeah. Um, that's on the stiffer side right. of most bows. But once you get that thing back to full draw, there's only a very short part of that draw cycle that is 75 pounds. Yep. Once you get to the back wall with the technology and the cams, there's actually let off. So you might get to the back wall, which is full extension on the bow and then you might be holding 16 pounds right but you're holding 16 pounds apart while you're trying to aim it and then make a good shot on it and then you're actually you have something on your wrist that then is still a trigger point what is that yeah it's just a release um i use actually a handheld release there's okay. a couple different ones um there's the the wrist strap like you were talking okay. about and that usually holds most of the weight or you do one where it's a handheld where you're actually holding it in your hand and that's the thing that you're pulling against i personally like the handheld a little bit more um when i've used like the the wrist release 
it puts a lot of tension on my shoulder because you're not firing the muscles in your forearm yeah. and up through your arm to stabilize your shoulder. So you're really just pulling, pulling with your back. shoulder the whole time. And none of this is really activated. Um, when you pull with your hand, a lot of this is activated. Then you try to relax it to the point where, you know, you're not going to let it go, but you're using just enough to hold on to it and then make the shot. Yeah. I bring that up because I just think it's all these like little details that people don't think about in everything that we do. There's like to be excellent and going back to the CrossFit, which I kind of wanted to finish on of like, you're in a space that you keep saying it every little, the milliseconds count, right? Yeah. If you want to win a race, you want to be a Daytona 500 champion, those little things matter. And in CrossFit, the best even in the sport, I think, are only thinking about, I need to train harder to get better, but they're not thinking about the little details of, like, how do I learn how to perform both at the highest level but also under the pressure? And so Chris asked you this before you came on, but he was like, hey, what are your tips for getting better at anything that you do? What are your tips for, for performing under pressure? And I want to kind of finish with that so we can wrap everything up, but can you nail down a couple things that you would say are the most important things for the CrossFitter in the same vein that the NASCAR pit crew or the person that's a professional bow hunter should perform under pressure or how well, they should perform? Hold on. I, before you got into that, I was actually going to ask you, um, and this, this goes to your point about the pressure. When you started picking up the bow, I'm sure you didn't just go hunting right away. How did that change when it was like, okay, now I'm just practicing getting good at the skill to now I've got to connect with the target. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so like you're out back shooting in your backyard. There's really no consequences except for losing an arrow or shooting into your neighbor's house, right? Not great consequences. They're bad, but there's no real like – like the weight of it isn't – as heavy as when you go hunting like when you go hunting and you actually like that's the thing you want to do now you're now you you're essentially like you're going out there to harvest an animal you're going to take a life to sustain life like the weight of that is just so much more and it's it's so much more pressure because you want to make that as clean as possible you want to make that as ethical as possible or now it's not I'm not just out there shooting my target and I'm not like sometimes when I go out and shoot sometimes I just go shoot to shoot I don't really care how the arrows are hitting. I'm just out there relaxing, you know, meditating with my bows, some would say. Yeah, and that's just, just going to the gym and just doing a workout. And just enjoying it, yeah. And then there's, like, then there's times we start getting closer to hunting season. You start putting a lot more pressure, like, this had these have to be good shots. I have to execute perfectly. Get ready for the open. Because once you get there, you have to make it as efficient as possible because you get one opportunity to make a good shot. Everything else after that is, you know, it's clean up. So you want to go out there and make the best shot you can. It's like having your open workout. You have one good shot at Friday Night Lights to get this workout in. You put a lot of pressure on yourself. And then being able to manage that pressure and then execute a good shot under that pressure is what's going to Do you remember what it people. felt like the first time? I almost couldn't draw my bow back. You just had so much adrenaline because, like, the the moment hits you, like, right before you're there, like, and deer walks in and you're like, this is happening. Like, I'm going to do this. You've done enough reps where you kind of, it takes over, but it's that moment where you're like, I'm actually going to do the thing I set out to do. And then you kill that deer and then you get on it when, after you go to get it and get it out of the woods. And you're like, that moment just weighs so heavy on you that you're like all the time and effort I put into this and making sure I was as ethical as possible, making sure I made a good shot. I am now reaping the rewards or the benefits of this by putting organic meat on my table it's just the whole weight that is just like it's almost like a weight that's lifted off your shoulders to know you did a good job but then you have this huge emotional dump that is just like it's powerful yeah but the, i guess to tie it back it it's the same thing with with any sport or you any go out there hobby. yeah and you have these goals and you right, go out right. and you execute just like you planned on executing like you have the nerves before you get there it's happening. You're going to do the thing. You're in the middle of the workout, and you're like, I am perfectly executing. I am doing exactly what I set out to do. And then you get done with the workout, and you're just completely emotionally and physically drained because you're like, I did everything I needed to do. I did all the things I had set out to do. I reached the goal I needed. It feels so good. Yeah. So the first point that you said was that you fall to the level of your training, which I love that there's an old – I'm sure you probably took it from this, but like I a Navy it. SEAL, um, it said, under pressure, we don't rise to the occasion, but we fall to the level of our training, which is basically the same thing, right? Yeah, like, I, that's kind of where you... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how, 
Man, that is so, so true, especially in the CrossFit space where you do have to train all these, like there's 40 different movements that you have to be good at. Everyone's like, oh yeah, I'll just rise. The, like you hear, you hear announcers say this too, like, oh, that driver rose to the occasion yeah. or that football player rose to the occasion. It's like, no, they've been training you know, their Rich whole Froning, life. Rich Matt Frazier, they all rose to the occasion to win the CrossFit games. Well, they didn't rise to the occasion to win those things. It's all the stuff that they did in the gym, all the training that they did, all the intensity that they brought that when they needed to call upon those past experiences, it's something that they'd already done. They had already reached that level of intensity. They had already reached that level, you know, of achieving that goal in training. So they didn't rise to the occasion. Yeah, they might have gone out there and beat the athlete they were next to to win the whole thing, but they didn't do something on the training floor that they never did in the gym or they didn't at least have the building blocks to do. You know, so it's it's like, the same thing with you. Like if you're practicing Tuesday through Thursday for a race that's going to happen later that weekend, you're doing the same thing over and over and over again to we're perfect practicing, that, right? We're practicing on a car that has the exact same race setup that we're going to have. The same, you know, everything's the same. So when we get to the race and we go to execute, if something doesn't go right or you have the jitters or you're, oh, we have to gain, beat this car off pit road, you're not rising to the occasion. You're just doing what you've you're falling back on your training because you brought that intensity. You've put in the work all year long, all week long to be able to call on that. You just don't pull it out of thin air. You know, you can't just do it. Like I, I, I don't like it when announcers are like, Oh, they rose to the occasion. It's like, no, they've been doing that when nobody else is watching for hours, weeks, days, months. Yeah. And it's, they just reached on those, you know, they reached in their tool bag and they grabbed what they needed to. Yeah, it's that's what he's second nature. He just reached in his tool <laughs> bag and grabbed exactly <laughs> what he needed to. Man, if if anything though, I really would encourage everyone that does listen that's that's serious about the sport of CrossFit to to think about that with their training. And it doesn't just mean intensity in the way that most CrossFitters think of it. Like I'm just going to breathe really hard and kill myself in training. It's the intensity and the focus in every little detail from it, movement of, yeah. movement patterns and efficiency to transitions, which we talked about over and over again. That Dialing those in in your training so that when you get out there and it is under pressure, you're able to rise to that occasion. You're not just going in the gym and working out just to work out. You're When you go and you have a training program, you that block for the day, you're going in. You're like, okay, I'm going to focus on all these things. I'm going to make sure I bring the most intensity to these things. I'm going to put a lot of extra effort into them to make sure they're dialed in. So that way when I get into that moment and the pressure's on and you're not really thinking and your arms feel like jello, you can just, I've done this. And yeah. you can reach back to that bag, and, you know, that tool bag and grab the hammer that you need to go <laughs> the beat bag. the competition. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right. So that was number one. Number two was don't try to control everything, which I'm sure in, in NASCAR, that is more true than CrossFit, but give us some examples of that. So I had one of my greatest pit coaches ever. He said, you know, see the ball, hit the ball. The only thing you can control is what is right in front of you. I can't control what any other team does on pit road. I can't control what my teammates do on the car that I'm on. The only thing that I can do is control what I am assigned to do in my task. And if I can make sure that what I'm doing right in front of me is right, everything else is going to fall in line. So like tying it back into CrossFit, it's like I'm not worried about the people I'm competing next to. I am running my race. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to take the breaks when I need to take the breaks because I know my plan, if we execute, we're going to beat everybody else. So as long as I do the thing that's in front of me, I'm not worried about the next workout. I'm not worried about the 50 set of toes to bar. That's four movements later. I'm worried about executing in the moment and making sure those. And plus, when you have small goals like that, like I'm going to get through this set of chest to bar, or I'm going to do these overhead squats. It makes that chunk way easier to get through than if I you're totally thinking about, agree. oh my God, I have 150 cal row after I do these overhead squats. All of a sudden, those overhead squats took you a minute longer than they should have because you're like, I need a save for that. When yeah. you really, you don't. I love having micro goals in workouts, especially long ones. Like if it is a chipper where it's like 50, 50, 50, 50, yeah. or wh whatever it may be. Like just, this is the set that I'm on. These are the chest bars I have to complete, and that's the focus. And then they can move on to the next thing, so on and so forth. Early on in my career, I think I did the opposite. It was like I was so worried about the outcome. Like I was so worried about we need to beat these cars off pit road that you end up messing up the pit stop and you don't beat the cars off pit road. But then once you start worrying about, I'm going to do my job, I'm going to make sure that I'm the best teammate I can be for my guys. And if I execute, they'll execute. And if we execute, nobody can beat us. Yeah. And it's probably just a better way to, to frame your mind before a big oh, competition. Yeah. How or long a race? did it take you to get, sorry, Brandon, to get to where you could do that? Was it like a, what, did you snap into it or was it years of like, man, stop thinking about that other shit? I think the thing that 
I read a book, A Champion's Mind. I don't remember who mm-hmm. wrote it, yeah. but it was a, like a lot of this stuff comes from that book, right. and it was just how to like frame your your mind and like how to worry, like train your how to train your mind to like be able to execute and be able to put yourself in the right mindset to like build on those blocks, so that way when you need to reach into your tool bag, you can grab the one you need. But do those thoughts, uh, you the example you just gave is like not worrying about beating the other pit crews. Now, do those thoughts? Thoughts still pop into your head and you ignore Every them? Week. Okay. Every stop. So it's just you're you're more trained to deal with them. It's yeah. not that they don't happen. They happen all the time. You just I just and now it's something like it's a fourth it's something that I am actively thinking about. Like I'm not thinking about which will go into the last point. It's it's I'm not thinking about what anyone else is doing. I'm just thinking about what I need to do and executing the task that's in front of me. And if you were thinking about what everyone else is doing, then you're wasting time because you're not focusing on the thing that you you're need to do. You're not doing what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, do you remember what I interrupt? So <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember. I'm but sure it was going to be the, sweet. The, the last one is about mindset, which kind of ties everything yeah. together, right? Like you have to have the right mindset, which is about your training and is about making sure you just control what you can control. So talk on that. The mindset part of it, it kind of all it encompasses those first two. Like if you can do the things that you need to do, like when the, you get the jitters, like you get the shanks and golf, sure. you have the yips, right? It's something you're in the weight, you're warming up for Keep this workout. Going. I want more, <laughs> yeah. more words. <laughs> you're, you're warming up for this workout and like, it's got 155 pound snatches and all of a sudden you can't snatch 135 yeah. because you're thinking about like, oh, I can't do this. And like, now you have the wrong mindset or the wrong thoughts in your head. That's like, I need to, I need to, I need to get these snatches done. I need to like, why can't I hit these in my warm up? And it just, it puts you in a position where you're already setting yourself up for failure. So when I get the yips, which happens throughout the season, you know, you get the shanks and golf. The thing I try to think about is doing the first thing right. And that's the only thing I'm focused on. And that's the mindset I want to have. I don't care if everything else goes wrong. I'm going to do the first thing right. When the car comes in and he comes to a stop, I'm going to put the socket on the lug nut. That's the only thing I'm thinking about. And then if you trust your process and the stuff that we talked about in the beginning, you've layered all those training blocks together You've brought the intensity. You've put the focus on that. When that car comes in and you're, you know, last stop, you got to have this stop to win the championship. Car comes in, you put the socket on the lug nut, and now all of a sudden everything else, you kind of, like, doesn't go blank, but it just, everything else just starts to happen. Do the first thing right. Do the first thing right. Like, if you're trying to hit a good, like, if you're in the warm-up area and you're trying to hit a snatch to get ready for this workout and you can't, just focus on getting a good setup and get the bar six inches off the ground. If you have trained properly and you have brought intensity and focus into your training program, then once you get that thing six inches off the ground, all of a sudden your your body takes over and you're not thinking about it. And like the I've been in the the flow the people call it the flow state. I've been in it where you're like you're almost inside your own head watching yourself do the job that you're supposed to do. Where it's like everything's happening and you're like you're not thinking about I'm not forcing this, I'm not trying to push this. It's just happening and you're just like observing. Yeah. And it's like really cool. But that only comes with those three things. That right? only like, comes when you've layered on top and you've brought the right intensity. And that only comes when you're only worrying about the stuff that you're worried about. If I'm worried about the other cars on pit road while I'm trying to do my first thing right, it's not going to work yeah. out well. So you uh, flew here private today. Is this true? This is true. Okay. But I saw you pull up in a minivan. So this like, also what's, true. what's going on here? Like there's some, there's Dude, a- minivans are fucking sweet. <laughs> they are actually really cool. Sorry. I had to finish with that. <laughs> yeah. He was telling me you flew in private, and yeah. I was like, wait, this dude's driving a, a minivan. What do you in. want me to roll in a roll? <laughs> hold on, hold on. That's what I wanted. We're wrapping up. <laughs> I want him to give us one bonus tip while we're here. When you do, so you got everything's on the line. You know, let's say you're coming in. You can win a race. Everyone's pitting. You know, this is going to be the last pit before the final three laps, something crazy, right? It's all on the line, and you make a, you make a mistake. How do you deal with making a mistake and, and move on from it? So the way I, I try to tell a lot of our young guys, because I've been doing it long enough, you're going to do 300 to 350 pit stops throughout the year. You can't, you're going to do 10 of them that are going to be perfect. You're going to be in that flow state. It, it, things are just going to happen. Everybody's going to click. It's just going to be perfect. You're going to have 10 that are absolute utter disasters that you just want to shut out and you do not want to like pretend they never happened. The rest of them, the 330 of them are going to fall somewhere in the middle. And now if one of those pit stops is one that falls in the middle, well, that's okay because you have 349 more pit stops throughout the year. It's just an ill-timed pit stop, and some of that is could be because you weren't thinking about the you know doing your job. Um, sometimes things just go wrong, and when you play enough sport and you you put yourself in those positions enough, they happen. But the good things happen more often because like they happen for me. I've been in that position. I've lost the race for our team on a pit stop. Okay, where are we going next week? 
Like you just have to focus forward yeah. on the next task. You can't change something that's already done. So you might as well just focus on making the next one better. Mm. Learn from it. Yeah. How it, does it like, I guess you're trying to just improve your averages in those 330 stops then like those middle ones where it's maybe kind of, it, this is just like, okay, whatever. Yeah. And what is it just like make those better and better? Is that the, yeah, you're just trying to make them like make them tighter together. Yeah. Like you're just trying to like keep them further off of the deviated. Curve right. The, the bad ones. Yeah. You're just like, like I said, you're going to have both ends of the spectrum. You just want to make that middle section as, as best as you can. You're right. going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. Michael Jordan misses free throws. Like all the great golfers, they miss the green. You know, they miss the putt that they needed, and it happens. But the ones that are great are the ones that are focused on the next thing. And then, then when they're making mistakes, you know, instead of missing the green entirely, they might miss it ten feet to the left. Right. You know, so they're they're mitigating their mistakes. They're they're knowing their misses and knowing you like your tendencies, knowing your misses will help you drag all that like that that average down. Yeah, and that's is so important in the sport of CrossFit is knowing it, it wouldn't be considered misses maybe, but knowing your limitations yeah. or your weaknesses and then you're you're mitigating that by just getting a little bit better. But you don't have to make this as good as Rich Froning or as good as Tia Tumi. You just have to make it a little bit better so that you don't have that huge mistake in a competition. I know I'm not good at handstand push ups. When handstand push ups come to work out, I base my entire workout around okay, how can I get to these handstand push ups as efficiently as possible and just get them out of the way yeah, or just, exactly like, just right. move on. Like I don't have to be great at them. I don't have to do it as an unbroken set. I just have to do the best that I can, which might not be great, but just then move on to the things that I'm good at. Yeah. Well, Jeff, thanks for coming on. Thanks Congratulations for, for being a 2024 Daytona 500 champion. Appreciate you it. Have anything yeah. Well, else? actually, so we film, we're filming this now on the February 23rd while you're in here in town for the Atlanta race. This will come out uh, after the open heading into quarterfinals. Uh, if people want to like, Get into NASCAR, maybe. Like, at this point, y'all have won a race, the mm -hmm. Daytona 500. <laughs> and uh, so this guarantees you into the playoffs, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, so what, what, what? if they want to get into the sport and they want to follow the 24 car, what do you recommend them do if they're new people who have never watched a race? Uh, I mean, we race just about every Sunday, right about 3 o'clock. Um, NASCAR.com is a great resource for the schedule. Team Hendrick on Instagram, William Byron. Uh, there's a great Netflix just put out like a great documentary on it. Our boy right here has year. a big shot of his whole face. Yeah, yeah. Like oh yeah. Whole you get like screen. a you get like a five second. The whole screen. Yeah. Put yep. it on. The, put it on the the big screen. They do a really good job in that documentary about kind of like laying it all out. And Marty Smith is like the biggest pit crew fan ever, and is awesome. <laughs> so he like really yeah, churches the pit crews up in that. Yep. Cool. So go check that out. Travis Mayer watched it. He loved it. Brandon's going to watch well, it. Well, we don't have we don't have Reese Netflix. Subscribes and he says, I know. "Well, we were trying to budget and we canceled our." <laughs> <laughs> don't don't get me started. <laughs> Jordan hates me right now. I'm like, oh, we're cutting that out. We're cutting that out. <laughs> All right. I'll subscribe. You. See you guys. Peace.